So, uh, we have this story in the Indian scriptures, many beautiful stories. Savitri is one such story. And the story is of Ganga Avataran. So, uh, as we know, the children of Sagar had lost their way and they had ultimately turned to ashes. They were as good as dead and they were taking a nap in the subconscient uh, where they had completely, they were not able to live, breathe, move and then to revive them, King Sagar undertakes a penance and it goes through generations till finally Bhagirath. He aspires and does the tapasya and Ganga comes down and redeems them. So often I feel the story of Savitri, the epic Savitri, the book Savitri is um, along similar lines. Its origin, just like Ganga originated in the heart of Vishnu, when he was seeing the dance of Shiva, the dance of Shiva was meant to initially to redeem the music which were full of discordant notes thanks to us earthlings. So, uh, this Mahaganga called Savitri originates from the heart of Sri Aurobindo. In response to the, all the chaos, the disorder, the distortion upon earth that has taken place. And here we see one distinction between Sri um, I don't like to use the word metaphysics, but the vision of uh, reality and what is conventionally called in the Indian tradition as Mayavad. So there is a conception of world as Maya, an illusion and the reality which is the supreme reality, call it by whatever name, he listens to everything without ears, that's the beauty. He doesn't need the ears, we need ears to listen, we need eyes to see. So uh, this reality is the sole truth behind it and the creation is Maya, an illusion. So who would like to be trapped in a Maya? As long as the um, cinema is, there are good scenes, it's okay. But when the cinema becomes rough and tough, just quit it and come out. You were never meant to be there. Now this makes a nonsense of the creator. Because how come this creation has come into being if it is mere nothing or an illusion? So Sri um, yoga vision is that this creation is not illusion in the sense of a non existent something. But it is an illusion in the sense that it is a distortion of the one reality which is hidden behind. Now that begins to make sense. So in every age the divine comes and puts things right but in the process he takes it one step forward. But then we are the ones who have to hold that flame, carry it further and in the course of time, it gets more and more distorted. That's the Dharma Siglani spoken of in the Gita. And then once again the avatar comes, sets things right, once again gives a cosmic order, but a new cosmic order, a new law which is appropriate to the age. Because Sanatan Dharma has an eternal aspect, the eternal law. But in its unfolding, it, there is also something known as Yuga Dharma. So, in each age of mankind, this law is given in a way which is appropriate to that age, which uh, most people can follow. And also, in the course of time, it because humanity has moved forward, creation is always moving forward. <coughs> however distorted it may look, however cyclic it may be, but there is a kind of forward movement ultimately. So, it once again, appropriate to that movement, to that age, it restores the dharma, and the flow towards a greater and greater, higher and higher manifestation of the divine reality. So, we see in the story of Ganga, Shiva has to dance to set once again into order all the noises because of the noise, because of the discordant notes that our human speech creates. So, this time we see that uh, much had happened. It's not just about the human speech. The wrestle, the clash, the wars. So, Shurbindo, like Bhagirath, he brings down the Mahaganga and once again sets things right on the right course, gives a new order 
and uses a language which is appropriate to the age in which we live, there are images and metaphors and symbols which are much more appropriate, we can connect with them a lot more today. So in the Vedas, the image will be of cow. And here Shobinda will speak about, you know, flights, he will speak about television, he will speak about printing press, <laughs> in the magic printing press, because these are the images with which we connect. So he gives, restores the Sanatan Dharma, at the same time takes it one step forward, because that is the purpose of each avatar. It is not to just keep repeating the same truth, but give it a new form, new shape, and a new impulsion to move one step forward, because it's an unfolding. So we can conceive of Savitri as the Mahaganga. Origin is Shurabindo, meaning thereby every time. That's why Ganga is purifying. Because when we take a dip in gang, Ganga, we are taking a dip in the heart of Mahavishnu. So that is a that is purifying. So when we read Savitri, we are actually coming in contact with the heart of Shurabindo. As simple as that. So that's where it is originating from. And the water is nothing else but the mother's love. Flowing right from the origin, who is there in the heart of Shirobindo? But the mother, very often people ask, what is the relation between mother and Shirobindo? My simple way is, the mother is the heart of Shirobindo. So, <laughs> and she says that also, she came out from there and manifested. So this Mahaganga, which is a tangible form of the Divine Mother's purifying, transforming love. So wherever we take, we have this tradition, when Ganga Jal comes to home, we don't question which ghat you picked it up from. We receive it, we drink it. Sometimes if we have too much of it, we can bathe into it. Uh, if we have too, too much, we can drown into it. In any which way, it will do its magic. So reading Savitri from anywhere has the same wonderful effect. But just as the Ganga though one takes different courses, turns, so Savitri also we see, it uh, starts from Gomuk, where from that state, from where there is not even a trickle of creation and then it moves through different cities. Each city is like a book. So there are 12 books. So each city has a description, when Ganga goes to Varanasi, then you have a description of Varanasi. What is Varanasi? So similarly, each book is, describes a certain, it's connected with one common theme, like the book of fate. We are in the city of fate. So all that determines our fate, all the forces that are being revealed here. When it goes through the book of love, then we can say we are in the city of love, but not city of love as we understand today, but the original city of love, what love is what it is meant to be, how it is distorted, everything is revealed there. Or when we go through the book of death or the descent into night, we can take it that Ganga descended into Patal and became Patal Ganga. But doesn't matter, it is purifying even there. You see, there are Patal Ganga, there is Gupta Ganga. <laughs> so, all through we see it has the same magic effect because some people believe, no, no, we should not read book 2, canto 7 and 8 because it death and falsehood. But it is the Ganges which is carrying us and these are also domains which must be conquered, won back for the divine. And so when we go through the stream of Ganges, down below and then emerge up into the world of paradise, it's so beautiful. So that's how in each city, so there are 12 books which are like 12 cities, and in each city, Ganga has many ghats. So in uh, Varanasi, you go, you see from Varuna ghat to Assi ghat. Now they have added one more, Modi ghat. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there may be more. But anyways, there are so many ghats. Each ghat has its own flavor. So when you go to Manikanika ghat, you develop a Vairagya. When you go to Harish Chandra Ghat, because you see all the time, you know, that's why the movie was named Manikanika, by the way. Because, you know, it's flames where people are constantly... Uh, dead bodies are being taken there to be burnt, Harish Chandra Ghat. But if you go to the Assi Ghat, so you think of Tulsi Das sitting there and that famous line comes, um, Ghat par Tulsi Das is writing, Chitrakut ke Ghat par uh, Tulsi Das is writing, you know, the Ramayana. And who is uh, guarding him? Rama and Lakshmana. So we, each canto is like a Ghat. Within a book, there are several Ghats. So each ghat has its own flavor and beauty, but it's connected in that book. So this is how we see the 
marvel of this ganges is flowing and there is also the sangam we shouldn't forget uh, before the sangam there are several tributaries so those of us who are accustomed to let's say the vedic lore the upanishads the gita the puranic literature the greek mythology we will suddenly see a stream entering into it for instance mother of uh, seven sorrows so one wonders where is seven sorrows coming so this is a stream coming from the jerusalem and joining into this or when we read about the robbers of the deeps so you remember the vedic legend robbers of the deeps who are connecting in this stream and you know that beautiful story or when we hear about the circean wines the daughter of circe we remember the greek mythology and a stream of that greek yoga is coming and joining or when we read those majestic lines uh, you know fountain head of world's delight o wisdom splendor o truth defended in thy secret sun straight away one remembers yagnavalk's line in the upanishad hiranmayena patrena satya syapihitam mukham tattvam pushan pavranu satya dharmaye drishte so he wants to see now that prayer has to be fulfilled sometime no because he only aspired but in the absence of sun he says agni agne na supataraye when the law of sun will come it's okay but now there is night <laughs> so the rishi says o oh, agni you show me the path of the light and the right make the crooked straight aspiration but his prayer remains for centuries that's why i say this is the project of the divine which has come to its fulfillment now comes the answer sure bindu adds his own to that aspiration of the ages o oh, truth defended in thy secret sun maybe i should just read this line and <laughs> because um these are marvelous lines that come toward the end of ashupati's yoga he wants the divine mother to descend upon earth uh, like you know bhagirath is asking mahaganga to come down so ganga says how will i come down who will hold me not one fellow is ready the world will collapse see something very similar when he stands on the doors of the divine mother in book 3 canto 4 he asked the mother to come down because he has come to take you know solve the permanent solution to the misery of the world and on page 335 she says yes i know you are asking me to come down you are strong enough to bear it o son of strength who climbs to creation speaks no soul is thy companion in the light alone thou standest at the eternal doors what thou hast won is thine but ask no more you can't uh, you know the supramental world who is wanting it you are alone ask people do they want the supramental transformation new creation they want the divine but only to perpetuate the old creation this is the problem and then we have the similar lines which uh, you know is uh, bhagirath is told that if ganga descends everybody will be drowned we know that one day mandakini suddenly uh, became tivra gamini you know because she is manda <laughs> and what happened in that entire kedarnath area so we we are told i am the mystery beyond reach of mind just marvel at these lines anywhere one reads it's ganga jal i am the goal of the travail of the suns my fire and sweetness are the cause of life but to immense my danger and my joy awake not the immeasurable descent speak not my secret name to hostile time man is too weak to bear the infinite's weight truth born too soon might break the imperfect earth this was the problem of shirobindo <laughs> why why was taking years and years he was experiencing the supramental but because he was not wanting it for himself the problem was the earth nobody is ready you know in 47 uh, mother describes that time she says actually it was coming down but he says nobody was ready and when he saw that the world is not ready and human beings are so unconscious then he did not blame humanity this is something very interesting he rather entered into the darkness to make things ready there that's how the mother describes 
so we have here the aspiration of the ages asadoma sadgamya or you know yagnaval when he says here and mayna patrena satya syapihi tam mukham the face of truth is covered by a golden lid and then he says that you remove that veil so that we may live by the law of truth aspiration is then but still we labored under the law of yama law of death <laughs> this is the difference yama is the son of surya the law of truth and the law of darkness so why he is born as son of surya the story the legend goes that surya's wife is sangya sangya is all consciousness but still surya is too teevra too intense so one day she asked chaya to be around him so interesting so yama is born out of surya and chaya and when surya realizes that he is you know this is not fair so he casts yama away so yama becomes the guardian of the worlds of darkness of martlok meaning thereby there are two laws that are operating upon earth at any given point of time one when we are in ignorance the mother calls it the schooling of ignorance where we are schooled through measures desire mister pain headmaster suffering etc etc not a good school yeah? nobody likes to go to that school but times are changing and so we have the other school in which the divine mother wants us to enter that is the free progress school of truth each one has to discover his own path and go through that it is the law of truth the law of truth doesn't want us to suffer but because we cannot bear it like the seed has to be buried inside the earth till it is ready to face the sun so for a long time it has to travel in darkness so ashupati standing on the gates of the divine mother is praying to her o truth defended in the secret sun voice of a mighty musings in shut heavens on things withdrawn within a luminous depths o wisdom splendor mother of the universe creatrix the eternal's artist bride this is page 345 345 creatrix the eternal's artist bride this is straight away we have that uh, term used in rigveda brahma jaya the bride of brahman so eternal's artist bride linger not long with thy transmuting hand pressed vainly on one golden bar of time as if time dare not open its heart to god o radiant fountain of the world's delight world free and unattainable above o bliss who ever dwellest deep hid within while men seek the outside and never find so he says is the prayer of yagyavalk it is in ishupanishad but how much he has he has seen everything that is behind and he says you come how long will we travel with this fire in the night <laughs> we want things to change here and then we see that this time she grants it okay i will come o strong forerunner i have heard thy cry so she grants the boon of course it is referring to the coming of the divine mother and the supramental force consciousness which will be upon earth which will redeem but also its manifestation is savitri because savitri is the link see those who have directly turned to mother and given themselves to her need actually nothing this is so true she takes care of everything and those who somehow have managed to not like uh, sampati or hanuman actually opened so much to the supramental consciousness more likely it is likely that one has entered into an inframental state and starts believing all kinds of thing but supposing then it starts working inside but there has to be a link what will carry us to that point where we become ready so we have savitri which makes us ready opens us to the same consciousness it is that speech like dance of shiva it is the speech of the divine which once again 
bring builds harmony and beauty and love uh, according to the original plan of the divine so this is savitri's magic so the journey starts actually as we said from book 1 canto 3 where we see suddenly we are introduced to savitri uh, to ashupati in the original legend all that we know is ashupati was a noble king very pious king who lived according to dharma a dharma of course in the indian thought has a very different connotation than the way we understand but <laughs> we'll not get into that here ashupati is um, you know introduced as a forerunner a representative of humanity he is the forerunner he is the one who is uh, ahead of the rest of humanity after all who was the noble one in in the gita there is uh, this term shobindra speaks about it arya shresth who was shresth those who are the highest among humanity who bear the greatest ideal this is something very beautiful about uh, indian thought uh, you know uh, if we look at the psychology as it stands today i am talking of textbooks of psychology there are only two categories or rather one category abnormal the rest we don't know you ask what is normal well all the rest is normal but india had the conception not only of the abnormal and the normal but the supernormal so ram is supernormal krishna is supernormal shobindra is supernormal because that's our journey we have to go there so this is where we see ashupati is described as somebody who is already ahead where is he moving towards supernormalcy so in book 1 canto 3 we see ashupati is flooded with experiences of his supernormal nature his senses have opened to a different vision different uh, hearing he is hearing sounds which one cannot hear normally uh, those auditions uh, which earth cannot you see in kain upanishad we have this that which the ears cannot hear but that by which the ear is motivated to hear so he is suddenly tuning himself to the truths the symphonies which are behind the chaos and noise and cacophony of earth his sight is beginning to see visions which ordinarily we do not uh, behold he is seeing form of the gods he is seeing the titan kings all this he is experiencing smells taste touch perception everything is undergoing a change so ashupati is a um, high forerunner and in book 1 canto 3 we'll read it when we come to the canto shobindra describes reaching this point what all he has journeyed already and that's our journey passenger from life to life from scale to scale so this bodily appearance is not all shobindra describes so beautifully he deep in man's celestial powers can dwell his fragile ship now this his people often say he is and he, he and she now here his is about us his fragile ship because why because he is referring to man his fragile ship <laughs> conveys through the sea <coughs> of years several places we will see here shurbindo describing this world in a very interesting way sea ocean time time is not just a linear movement time is a sinusoidal wave form movement it rises and comes down all of us experience it what we do not know is that through all this up and down it is moving forward <laughs> that is the beauty of it so his fragile ship conveys fragile ship is the body so fragile through the sea of years an incognito of the imperishable something in us which is imperishable but we do not know it has no name no identity card it doesn't belong to this country that country this tradition that tradition it is something independent why because it has lived in all climes that's how the mother when mother was asked she says i belong to no nation no civilization nothing because she is beyond all this nobody can uh, compel me to say except the lord i do what the lord wants me to do i say what the lord wants me to say how beautiful it is to belong only to truth all this universe is that a manifestation of that so ashupati is has reached this entire journey in ignorance he has traced and we had read those lines uh, yesterday you know then in is revealed in man the covert divine so the divine has already begun to reveal in him he has reached that point and then once it has happened how ashupati is being prepared for this great uh, work for which he has come 
that he has reached a point where this fragile mud engine is being beaten into become blocks of strength, steel to bear the inrush and onrush of the greater consciousness. So we see book 1, Canto 3, Ashupati's early yoga, which is released from ignorance. In this, we will see all about self-realization, which is uh, so much glorified everywhere. We will see uh, even experience of Ashupati reaching a state where he uh, uh, rests abode in indivisible time. He has gone beyond time into the timeless zone where he can at once experience the past, the present and the future. All this in Canto 3 itself. So one wonders, abhi kya bacha hai? Ho gaya. everything is over, nirvana is over. <laughs> he reads the still consciousness sustaining all. So those who, uh, you know, have this traditional thing about and, you know, self-realization, then they talk about Shurabindu's yoga. So I say, okay, this is book one, canto three. But this is only the beginning of a new journey. That's the beauty of Ashupati and of Shurabindu's life. If anything one has to learn from Shurabindu's life, there are many things to learn. But one thing, how he is able to completely renounce even a great realization for the sake of something which is towards the future. This is something one finds uh, beautifully in Shurabindu. In one of his letters to Barin, he writes that what the great yogis trust was only the hem of the transcendent. Because he says, why don't you come to Bengal and you know, people will be very nice, they will dance, you just have to talk to them about, um, I was going to say about Shurabindu. <laughs> ha, they will be very happy. Shurabindu says, nobody is ready right now. <laughs> he says, I don't want to do, he uses a very interesting word. He says, you know, if people are not ready, just by placing a monkey in a temple, he doesn't become Hanuman. <laughs> so, this is a, so symbolic. <laughs> Hanuman is Hanuman, it's not any monkey. We can worship, uh, monkey will be pleased, of course, they'd like it, you know, they are very much, I think they have caught all the disease of human beings, so they like, uh, if you worship them, they... They even snatch away mobile and uh, your goggles. I have seen it right in front of me. Um, Ravinji. <laughs> Palak's father. He took us and he cautioned us that, see, we are going to, um, uh, you know, take a dip in the Yamuna, but uh, monkeys are there. Please keep your goggles and if you have glasses, keep them inside because he cautioned us. But sure enough, the monkey took his glasses and then, you know, he wouldn't give. So, monkeys have learnt all these things. But that doesn't mean he's Hanuman. Hanuman is the servant and disciple and bhakta of the Lord. He is none else but Shiva in another form who has come to show us what true bhakti and seva is. So, Sri says, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. So, book 1, canto 3, normally yoga would have finished. But Ashwapati is not happy. Why? Because in book 1, canto 4, he suddenly sees something. He has access to the secret knowledge. Secret knowledge literally means uh, that knowledge which cannot be uh, understood by the mind nor grasped by the senses. So it is secret. But there is a key to it. You cannot grasp it by the mind and cannot see it, but know it by the senses. But there is a key. So Ashupati has got the key. And how he has got the key? He continued to live where breath is stops and heartbeat stops. He continued to live even though he is physically experiencing death. And he has entered into that magic place. And there he sees and what he sees that discovery is described. And there he sees there is a purpose in the mighty mother's random whim. When we look at the appearances of the world it looks so random. Almost looks like a whimsical god. Uh, what is this suddenly? Why is it that Pandavas have to suffer? Why Harish Chandra Raja? In my house, every year we used to have Raja Harish Chandra ka katha. My, my father's name was Harish Chandra, maybe he took a fancy. So it was every that Harish Chandra and though we enjoy, but we used to feel, oh my God, so much he is suffering. Why this extent? Why God has to wait for the last moment when every bit of dress has gone? Then he will, then truth manifest. What is this? Now I understand. That my dad was right <laughs> in holding this katha every year. That, you know, truth is like that. 
Any, every bit must be stripped bare before one can even become a candidate for truth. So he sees that there is a truth occult behind this world and that is manifesting itself in various names, forms and all is a play of the two. Ishwara and Shakti, Brahman and Maya, Purush and Prakriti, they are not two but one, but two modes, static and dynamic aspects of the one. And they are playing in this world, there are two who are one and play in many worlds. And they are the one who are writing the story of a life. This is very interesting. He is the vision and the world he has made. He is the maker and the world he has made. He is the vision and he is the seer. Then we begin to wonder. So he has seen all this. So he heals that antagonism between Purusha and Prakriti, world and God. He has realized it. And then he also realizes something which we don't find in traditional Vedantic lore. But the Gita speaks about it. First time we see it, very clearly it is spoken of God assuming a human body. The master of existence lurks in us and plays at hide and seek with his own force. In nature's instruments loiters secret God. But what is he doing? He time to time he becomes human, beast, different avatars. Why he becomes? So that we can become like him. This transfiguration is earth's due to heaven. So he has seen it. So then in Canto 5, we see Ashwapati has seen this great truth and now he has this aspiration, unique aspiration, which Sri has implanted upon earth in all of us. This earth should become a perfect place. So Mokshavadis, all right. But earth should become perfect. And then he describes it so beautifully. This body, the house in which the divine dwells, also must become befitting. We all know that this is the temple of the Lord. But what a temple? It should become the, the most divine, beautiful temple of the divine. So this is a new aspiration that seizes him. And then we have in book 1, Canto 5, as a result of his aspiration, there is this descent so beautifully described. Beauty half visible with celestial eyes, a vast descent leap down. And we have a description which almost seems like uh, Krishna and Kali. A sweetness dire. That is how he describes. That comes and in a moment, shorter than death, longer than time, suddenly he experiences that descent and un starts undergoing a transformation. This is Canto 5. Now, Ashapati could have gone ahead with the transformation, but he decides, no, I will renounce personal transformation. I want it for everybody. What a yagna, you know, it's like you are about to receive everything by your tapasya. Ashapati is the lord of tapasya. He replied, Ashapati, so the lord of the horse, horse is tapasya, the shakti. Such concentration. We know Sri used to experience this um, supramental descent within himself. And the mother describes so beautifully that when she asked Sri will it happen this time? The mother said, he looked and he said, yes. And she saw the supermind right then descending. She says the power of word. So, he was experiencing, but he renounces it. So, book one finishes, the book of beginnings. But this beginning itself is like, you know, Kanchanjanga looking on to Mount Everest. <laughs> so here Ashapati says, no, I want it for all. So we have book two where uh, Shurabindo takes us on a lovely journey. Whoever wants to see what is there in this world and other world and all the lokas, bhuvan, we hear in the Puranas that there is this lok, that lo lok. Now all that is described in this book, the book of the traveller of the worlds. Fortunately, they don't ask us a visa because we are going with Sri Aurobindo. Yeah, I am telling you, this is interesting. In Russia, we were stopped. One day, asked. <laughs> it was an interesting story. And we had the visa. So suddenly, and the person is asking why they had stopped. But they thought we are part of Krishna consciousness. Because they were very, at that time, you know, evangelism and Krishna consciousness, people are converting. So he kept asking me, Krishna, I didn't understand with that accent, what is that Krishna? 
I said, I know nothing. What did I don't understand what term you are using? Fortunately, this Yorubinda must have done that I couldn't catch the word Krishna. <laughs> he wailed. Krishna wailed himself. So I said, okay, okay, fine. So Krishna. I said, oh, this is in your... <laughs> So you see, in in the book, The Traveller of the Worlds, we see Ashapati takes us by his hand. So once again, people say, oh, I shouldn't read book 7, book 2, canto 7 and 8, Descent into Night, the world of falsehood. If, if the Lord is taking us, see in, in the Mahabharata, there is an episode where Arjuna makes all kinds of promises. You know, he is like us. He will make a promise, which now Lord is to fulfill. So he makes a promise. Those Brahman whose four children are dead. He says, I'll go. I, I have all the celestial weapons. I'll go and fetch, fetch them. <laughs> so Krishna says, how you will go? You can't reach the gates of Yama in the darkness. How you will survive? So he says, Madhav, aap hona. you are there. He says, okay. <laughs> A very beautiful story where Krishna takes him and when you read the description, the only thing I remember in the description is there is a point where it's pitch dark. Now, Krishna is an old uh, game at bringing out from the dead like, uh, you know, Puranjan, those, all that, he does that. So, he takes uh, Arjuna and then he brings them back from the land of the dead. That story is one part. So when we go into 7 and 8 book, we are still with the mantra of transformation which Savitri is. We are with the Ganga Jal entering the land of the dead. Literally that's how we say that if you take Ganga Jal, you are relieved from even in the land of dead, you have moksha. This is how we have grown up. I have seen magic, people suddenly on deathbed asking for Ganga Jal and Tulsi, one person I have seen and suddenly you declared paralyzed, going to die and all that he expressed is my father, like, you know, old time Brahmins that uh, uh, Pandiji ko boli hai thoda Ganga Jal and Tulsi he should put. My dad put conveniently Ganga Jal and Tulsi. Next day morning he was fine, he continued to live for many years. <laughs> In fact, he recovered from the paralysis. <laughs> Uh, much to the uh, disconcertation of his wife. <laughs> so that, that's a different thing. <laughs> but the point is that we are with the Ganga Jal. Savitri is every word is magic. She, Mother has said it is the mantra of transformation. So when we enter into a domain of darkness with the mantra of tar transformation. So what is going to happen? Even the darkness which is there in everyone. We may be afraid of it. It doesn't mean it is not there. And if we cannot look at existence straight in the face, there is a passage where Shobindo describes in Asis on the Gita, why is it that Arjuna was given the great vision on the battlefield? Why not Vidur? Why not Bhishma? Why not these, these X, Y, Z? Arjuna is like a you know regular guy. So, <laughs> of course, he is wonderful, uh, skillful, very skillful. He is tapasvi in his own job. And he is uh, surrendered to Krishna. But he is a regular guy. He is not like a holy person. He is not like a completely truthful like Yudhishthir. He is a nice person. But he has the vision. And Sri says, Why? Because he has not shrunk from the battle. And he can look existence straight in the face. And says, if you want to have this integral vision of the divine, you should be, have the courage to look existence straight in the face. Now, existence has its share of darkness. You can't wish it away. Give it to the titan or the satan or whatever it is. There is this aspect. We may not understand it. So we pray, teach us and he will reveal. So when we enter into these worlds, Patal Ganga, I call it. So, those parts in us, we begin to see, oh, this is how it operates. We understand the operating system of darkness and it begins to change. So, there is a whole journey running through 15 cantos in Traveller of the Worlds. Initially gives us an overview of the worlds there and what a description. The entire how creation with the Panch Tattvas comes into being. What are we doing here? The sacrifice of the Divine Mother and he describes it as like waves. Not the way we draw it on a chart. Waves which are climbing. Now waves give a sense of continuity. Not like lines, this domain, that domain. There is a mixing up also which is going on. That's how when he describes the planes and parts of the being. So there is a physical vital, physical mental. There is also corresponding vital mind, vital physical. 
all this vital vital there is an interlacing interconnectedness so he describes it as waves foam main tops rising towards unseen skies and dipping towards unseen depths that's how he describes the parvati temple hill top temple in his poem that it is rising to the skies which we cannot see and its roots are below which we cannot see or rather its base is going below so then he takes us one by one the world immediately behind us this gross physical subtle physical world it's a magic place full of beauty everything there is beautiful if we really want to know what is our original form beauty beauty then we'll see it in subtle physical everybody there there is nothing like uh, ugly forms because it's a world of forms it is the last form maker and it makes beautiful forms what happens to these forms from the subtle physical we dip into the inconscient and coal tar everything comes back all distorted after that whatever facial cream you may apply vitamin e you may take you will only make them rich it's okay our business to make them rich if we want to so this is how in subtle physical he describes how subtle physical is so important in our everyday life it can uh, thought illnesses their attack what happens after death it is in the subtle physical we carry in the subtle physical we can come to know about events and circumstances so everything in savitri is so much the entire knowledge is poured into it that well if we enter into the subtle physical we'll know that an event is going to happen it may happen in dreams we have that uh, instance of someone who mother recounts who who read in a cartoon uh, that there is a man uh, pointing towards a grave and then he came and in the lift he was going to go and the lift man somehow he felt ki he is like the same man and who was pointing to him toward the lift he said no baba i am not going to come and he took the stairs and the lift actually crashed so events before they take place in the physical i know plenty of such instances they manifest in the subtle physical and you can change them but then subtle physical is not all and why we had to leave this perfect world should be the describe because there is no grace or charm of error and defeat see how beautifully where there is no defeat no error no charm that's why shubhendra says in one of his aphorism never follow a leader who has never failed never fight a battle under someone who has never tasted defeat so from subtle physical we enter into the vital world there are plenty of vital worlds starting from the and each of these worlds has godheads these godheads are like nodes energy hubs transmitting and receivers and transmit so india has 33 million gods who are these gods they start with the original four we spoke about it i don't know here or somewhere else brahma vishnu shiva and krishna sat chit tapas ananda that's how it is logical sat is brahma exists infinite existence chit is vishnu infinite consciousness tapas is shiva infinite force and ananda is krishna infinite bliss from there they have so many ramifications creation comes layer by layer by layer and each where it has a trans receiving and transmitting hub and there is some godhead sitting in that hub who receives transmit but in the process distorts it just a little the mother has used the word they are formatures so they receive it then after that you know that story of manasa devi people go and Manasa is daughter of uh, one of the foster daughters of Shiva. Actually, she is daughter of Shiva, but who loses track? She is very angry on Shiva. She says, "You didn't uh, take care of me." <laughs> but she has that power to heal snake bite. At the same time, she is full of poison. Snake bite doesn't affect her. So when she gets angry, it's very dangerous. but shiva she ultimately listens because shiva is the guardian deity so this is how we have so many gods and goddesses so much so that when we grew up there was a uh, even for these viral infections now they have removed that uh, shitla devi and they have replaced it with all the vaccine hubs shitla devi was so simple you went to the temple and there was this shitla devi and you said shitla mata cure me you came and you had those neem ka pani now i am not advocating as a doctor uh, well it's okay i mean <laughs> it's a question of faith but ultimately i have actually had this this uh, pox where 
I was actually seeing all these snakes, cobras, little little cobras from the wall. Clear cut. Now I understand they were hostile forces. And my mother is saying, where is the snake, my child? There is nothing, nothing, nothing. I am saying, you can't see it. Don't you see? They are coming and attacking. Now I can laugh over it, but that time it was all, you know, what we call as hallucination, but actually they are attacks of these forces. So all these forces in the vital world, they are of two kinds. They are malevolent and they are benevolent forces. So the world of the malevolent forces, the lower vital world, where they deliberately interfere, suddenly they will interfere in speech. They will make us do things, say things impulsively, Later on, we regret. You know, that's how. But still they serve a greater purpose. That's how Sri Aurobindo described. The tools of the unknown, they yet serve the unknown. So, the typical example is in Ramayana. When suddenly Mantra comes and tells Kekai and Kekai is overcome with... She's not like that. She's actually a very nice lady. She has saved Dashrath and she laments later. But that moment, she's under the siege of these forces. But, thanks to this... Ravan and Kumkaran have to be liberated. So they still serve a purpose. That's why Shubhindu says, times, random accidents, God's secret plan. <laughs> so, so there's a whole hierarchy and he describes the worlds, he describes the forces, he describes the Godheads, uh, which are in that world. He doesn't give names, thankfully. And he describes how these energies act, how they enact the drama on earth and uses modern images. At one place he says, like the Morse code. <laughs> Very modern image. He says, what these fellows do? They poke you. Now, you know, you have that uh, Facebook or somewhere, poke. So they poke you. And suddenly speech will leap. And you don't know why I spoke the way you spoke, but they'll make you speak. And Sri uses the word troglodytes of the mind. They're hidden in the caverns of the subconscious. So we have these uh, lower vital, the little my, uh, little kingdoms and goddesses of the little life. So you have these cantos. Then greater life. Greater life is the world of Gandharvas and you know um, the, uh, the typical Indra, Apsaras and all this world of the, uh, from where poets, many poets, not poetry comes from very high, but there are poets of the vital world. All these romantic poets and music and uh, you know all this comes from imagination, creative imagination flourishes there. And it's a beautiful world. It is the world which is portrayed in the song Aachal ke tujhe mein leke chalu ek aise gagan ke tali As if you know by singing you can create it But imagination conjures it I'll take you to a griefless sky It looks like that But even before he enters glory and fall of life Canto 3 where he shows that life's origin is in the divine This is the basic premise of Sri That life's origin is in the divine Therefore within life is the seed of its own redemption because its origin is divine, it can change into a divine life. If its origin was not divine, it cannot be transmuted. So, glory and fall of life, and then the little life, and then the greater life, greater life, though this world of these uh, mid-world gods. But then he wonders, why this greater life, great ideals, which have manifested upon earth? See, Indra through Arjuna, and many of these Pavan, Putra, Bhima, why still the world collapses? So Ashupati says, let me see why this greater life is unable to go beyond. So he takes a dip into Patal Ganga. That is the descent into night and the worlds of falsehood. He says, oh, these are the fellows which pull creation down. You see, Hanuman is flying across, uh, leaping, not flying. It's a wrong way to put it. Leaping across the ocean. And suddenly he is pulled down by a uh, demoness who is in the nether deep. Who pulls, who catches the chaya, shadow and pulls down. Now this shadow which is always behind, which doesn't allow us to go beyond. Beyond a point this shadow will pull us back. Everybody, if somebody has not seen it, too bad, you will encounter it. So... <laughs> One day or the other one has to encounter. You cannot, none can reach heaven who has not gone through hell. But we are busy seeing other shadow. That's a different story altogether. And in fact, Sri says, children and soldiers of truth have to even go through it. Children and soldiers in the armies of light. How to go through it? Courage, their armor, faith, their sword, they must walk. And then he says, 
here must the traveller of the upward way, for daring, hell's kingdom winds the upward route. Pause. He must pause. He must not rush through that phase. Pause, or pass slowly. A prayer upon his lips and the great name. Because when we are caught up in that shadow, prayer and great name, ma, 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 ma. If we don't take that caution, if we say, "Are what is there? I will you start challenging darkness." Then he says, "What may happen? The soul which was climbing towards heaven collapses and sinks into darkness. It becomes the image of a fallen star, marked missing in the register of the gods." Therefore, the mother's name. Therefore, reading Savitri to connect us all the time with the divine mother. Then one comes out. Then you have the heaven of the jannat of uh, uh, those who have battled. Uh, those who have really faced the battle of life. That paradise. It's not for those who blow themselves up and kill children. That paradise is worse than. But those who have gone through this battle, they deserve the paradise. This paradise described in Greeks and everywhere. It's the typical Puranic swarga. So in that paradise, we rest a while, rejuvenating energies. We feel very happy. There we drink the original soma wine. Some taste of that we get. When we are ready, then we have to come back. That's what the Gita says. Those who go to the heaven will come back into this cycle because they are not freed. So from that, Ashwapati goes into the worlds of mind. Little mind, which is our mind. Little mind is the physical mind attached to the senses. Vital mind, the imaginative mind, the rational mind, which is our limit. But this is the little mind. There also we have godheads, and then the greater mind, the mind of the seers, sages, yogis who have ascended into the higher ranges. So from there, how things look, how they receive inspiration, intuition, revelations, and are not dependent on rational analytical processes. There, Ashwapati has the vision of the divine mother, the 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 great mother whom the tantrics have tried to please, but he wants to go beyond. She cannot address this problem, and then he goes beyond into the self of mind and the heavens of the ideal, the nirgun brahma, the sagun brahma, and then into the cosmic consciousness, the world soul, where he meets. <coughs> the world mother beautiful description we'll read as we come to the appropriate cantos so the world mother tells him you go beyond you want the three worlds i can give you you can become triloka adhipati but ashwapati is seeking is no i want to go beyond and he surrenders himself completely so she opens the door to the super mind so in book 2 canto 15 kingdoms of greater knowledge will see ashwapati stands on the rim of the overmind where overmind and supermind meet it's the junction not yet the supermind but on the rim where lover and love and beloved all become one where knowledge the knower and the known become one and then from there ashwapati enters into book 3 just to hearing it hearing it we begin to pant what tapasya shubhendu would have done he enters book 3 is he is door to door with the unknowable that's where the secret of the future of creation lies present we know but what is that future script which is not manifested in cosmos so we have directly that uh, indian thought where originally creation lies in a seed state in pragya nobody knows what it is and then from pragya it enters into hiranagarbha the cosmic consciousness so whatever is in the cosmic consciousness we can know but we cannot know what has not yet manifested that's why great yogis could know about the new creation which is yet to come and you enter into this poon pragya you will burn off you can't come back shubindu enters stands at the doors of the unknowable and it gives no response it says vanish nothing made could live in that state even the soul appears like a little drop which is going to vanish cosmos looks like a little moment which is going to disappear that's when he sees the far seen godhead of the whole sachidanand and as he stands on being's naked edge 
He says, this is not what I want. I have come all the way for this. <laughs> Even as he stands on being's naked edge, one step beyond and gone for forever. But he has come to solve the cosmic riddle. And then as he stands, he sees that eternal no, suddenly the Divine Mother comes out of the heart of the unknowable, the eternal yes and what a wonderful description. A being of wisdom, power and delight took to her breast world and nature and soul. Now he sees that here is the secret and the Divine Mother shows to him in Book 3, Canto 3, the original plan. Because how are we, you know, activism has this problem. That we want to correct what the Creator is doing without even knowing what He is doing. <laughs> so we need to know what is the original plan. Then we can align ourselves. So Ashapati is shown the original plan. What really creation is meant to be and it will be. And the Divine Mother cautions him. It's too soon. You are a forerunner, I know, but you have come too far away from the ordinary humanity. They are still panting in Nanital, enjoying the nice cup of tea in Kaladungi. You have gone beyond Mount Everest, Akash Ganga and everything. No soul is thy companion in the light, which is what we read. And Ashapati says, I am still connected to humanity. You have to grant me. If you come down, nothing is impossible. So the aspiration of ages is fulfilled and the Divine Mother says, O oh, strong forerunner, I have heard thy cry. One shall descend and break the iron law. Change nature's doom by the lone spirit's power. And she also declares when she will come. When will she come? In death's tremendous hour. <laughs> the divine, before you have the Siddhi Dhatri, you have Kalaratri. Then only, you can't bypass Kalaratri and have Mahagauri. You have to go through that again. So then he waits. Initially the Divine Mother has discouraged him. Go back. I know you have seen. It will happen. But he says, no, but I can't go back and live like this because how long will humanity suffer? See, this all this has happened behind the scene. That's why Mother says two things you must never forget. Sri compassion and the Mother's love. Sri compassion is that he denies his own realization. And wants it for everybody. Mother's love is that impelled by the divine love, she says, okay, I will come. What it must have meant, we can only imagine. If we are made to sit as so-called nice t-shirt, forget about other things. You are wearing a nice dress and you are made to sit with somebody who is foul smelling, wearing very uh, horrible, you know, we don't mind giving, but we can't sit there. You have to be Shiva to sit and eat with, <laughs> with the chandal and the swan. But normally, for the Divine Mother and Shurabindo to be with us is much more. Just to take a human body, she says, okay, I will come. And that's where Ashupati's yoga ends. Because he has seen everything and he wants and the Divine Mother has promised him. So that's where we see book of beginnings, book one, book of the traveler of the worlds, book two, and the book of the Divine Mother, where Ashupati has the vision of the Divine Mother and she must come, that ends. And th thereby ends part one of Savitri. So Savitri is in three parts. Part one is Ashupati's yoga. Part two is where we see the Divine Mother is born, she grows up, uh, she, she picks, chooses Satyavan, and then, you know, there is the word of fate and then she undertakes yoga. So, it's the story of the Divine Mother upon earth. Book 2. And then part 3 is where she is equipped and now she wrestles with death on our behalf. All that we need to do is like Satyavan, tell her, Ma, Ma, Oh my Mother, Oh World Mother, Mother alone and no other. So we'll meet tomorrow, 5.15, start with the part two and then part three. <coughs>